Good morning. We're starting a little 10 minutes later. You know how it gets when the questions and answers start coming, the interactive period, so we don't want to be behind. Uh, but welcome to everyone to the 2012 Fall CBC Health Brain Trust. And before I begin, I want to uh, thank those who have been longtime friends and partners of the Health Brain Trust and with out whom the work that we do would not be possible. Connie Bush and Ab Abbott Laboratories, Angela Reimer and Pfizer, Paul Brathwaite and the team from DaVita, Larry Lucas and the team from Pharma, and you'll hear from Connie and Larry in a little while, Jerome Murray and the team from Merck, AJ and the team from Gilead, and special thanks to Isaac Fajor and the teams at Blue Cross Blue Shield and WellPoint, as well as to Kimberly Bassett and the Wireless Foundation, uh, three new partnerships that I'm really pleased to have with us today. You know, extraordinary things happen when talented, dedicated people come together around a common cause, and that's what's happening today. And that includes you in the audience. I want to thank my colleagues from the Congressional Black Caucus, who will be some of whom will be joining us later, but uh, a few of them, like Congressman Bobby Scott from Virginia, who um, we're partnering with on the first session this morning. He'll be in and speaking hopefully very soon as we get started on that panel. I want to thank Maryland uh, Lieutenant Governor Anthony Brown, who graciously accepted our invitation to serve as our keynote speaker at lunch and to thank Dana Thompson, who used to be on the Hill with us, but now works in Governor O'Malley's office for all of his help in making that happen. We have some great moderators with us today. Ken, Dr. Ken Thorpe, Chairman of the Partnership to Fight Chronic Disease. Thomas Brunette, Attorney Thomas Brunette, who is the 2012 Lou Stokes Fellow, uh, uh, somebody that's been working with us before he got his law degree, but he's back now with us as a law uh, Lou Stokes Fellow. Uh, Mr. Darrell Thompson, the Deputy Chief of Staff for Intergovernmental and External Affairs to U.S. Senate Ma Majority Leader Harry Reid, but he also has some other connections to the Brain Trust. And last but not least, Dr. Linda Elam, the Deputy Director of the Medicaid Department of Healthcare Finance for the Government of the District of Columbia. And um, she's filling in for Bev, Bev Smith at the last minute, so we're really thankful that she could make the time to be with us today. Every fall we look at themes and we try to identify themes and related sessions that are not only relevant, but that inspire great discussion throughout the day. And then in turn inspire many of the nation's health equity ambassadors. Britt calls them ambassador, Britt calls you ambassadors. I call you health equity warriors because we, we got to really fight who have been invaluable partners and in support to my office and who faithfully join us every year. Uh, and then return to your respective communities and organizations to work tirelessly to move the health equity ball further down the road and in the right direction. Well, this year is no different. When we thought, we're thinking of themes, we thought about, well, what's happening that's current, that's been happening in the months leading up to today, and the constant and I dare say ugly attacks on the Affordable Care Act, and the, then the invigorating Supreme Court ruling of course, we had to include that in, in our discussion. But we also thought about the events that will unfold in the next two months, and it was crystal clear that we really had to talk about how we would protect the Affordable Care Act, because as the theme says, we're not there yet. And there's a lot, there are a lot of pitfalls along the way. So those of us here today are here because we care deeply about achieving health equity. And I know that we not only share a common overall interest, but we also share a sense of how we need to move forward to achieve this goal by not only reducing, but completely eliminating health, every health disparity that leaves millions of Americans, racial and ethnic minorities, women, rural populations, low-income populations, those with disabilities, um, those in the LGBT community without reliable access to affordable health care in poorer health and more likely to die prematurely from preventable conditions. So we all know the statistics in this room, so I'm not going to go into them, but we also know that health disparities not only carry a human health 
social and political costs, but a very real steep economic cost too. In fact, through the work of one of today's panelists, Dr. Brian Smedley, we now have a dollar figure for what racial and ethnic disparities cost this nation, and that's $1.24 trillion over just three years. So we need to work within and across all populations that are disproportionately and dis detrimentally affected by health disparities to leverage resources and expertise, learn from our own and each other's mistakes, and replicate successful efforts if we're ever going to reverse this egregious health disparity statistic that at best remains steady, but far too often is getting worse. So for to achieve health equity, there are several actionable steps that we can and have taken and should continue to take in the days, weeks, months, and years that follow today's Fall Health Brain Trust. First, we need to exhaust every avenue we each have, not only to defend the Affordable Care Act by raising much needed awareness about what the law includes. There's still a lot of uh, misunderstandings about that law deliberately planted. But we need to make sure that everyone understands what the law includes and ensure that every provision, especially that those that work directly and indirectly to reduce all health disparities and achieve health equity are fully implemented and more difficult and more importantly, fully funded. Each one of these provisions is listed in a document that was developed by Daniel Dawes, who is the Director of Government Relations at Morehouse now, also a former Lou Stokes Fellow, and that has been included in the folders that we're disseminating today. And in addition to looking at the Affordable Care Act, we have to save the next generation of leaders. And so today, we're going to also focus on bullying, on youth violence and suicide, and the inextricable link between the three, not only as criminal justice issues, but today for us as serious public health challenges that negatively affect the wellness lives and lives op life opportunities for far too many of our nation's children are rising leaders. The thoughtful insight and perspectives that our panelists on session one, which opens with a special presentation, hopefully soon by our good friend and colleague, Congressman Bobby Scott, and also includes the brave voice of a bullying victim and a future leader, Ms. Diara Moloch. They'll provide, help us to provide that focus. Third, we need to think thought, more thoughtfully and share lessons learned about how we can continue, support, and even duplicate efforts to reduce racial and ethnic, gender, geographic, and other disparity trends in prevention, prevalence, and incidence in treatment for chronic conditions and disease. Diseases. Those are topics which our expert panelists in session two will address. And to think critically about the minority health impact of some of the United States Preventive Services Task Force recommendations that have been made over the last two years. And I was with the um, with Fen talking about their recommendation on prostate screening. But the experts joining us today who will speak during the third session will highlight these recommendations and offer their perspectives on them. They also will share important information about breast, lung, and prostate cancer, as well as hepatitis C screenings that we all should take and share with our respective communities so that we can all be more engaged and informed health consumers, and so that we can all be armed with factual information to engage in more productive conversations with our respective healthcare providers about which screenings and early detection efforts we need and CMS needs to pay for. During the lunch, we'll hear from three speakers, each of whom will deliver presentations that are germane to our larger health equity efforts. First, Mr. Wayne Wright from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. He will share, Ms. Wainwright will share lessons learned from a current partnership that creates patient-centered medical homes by actively engaging healthcare providers who served in underserved urban communities. Second, Dr. Ole Iwola will talk about Text for Baby, Text for Baby, a very clever free mobile health initiative that has and hopefully will continue to bring accurate, culturally competent, and easy to understand health information to expecting and current parents. Third, we're really happy that 
Uh, this person could join us as well. We'll hear from our lunch keynote, Maryland Lieutenant Governor Anthony Brown, who will share with us just exactly how much progress can be made around health disparity elimination and health equity when the commitment from the bottom up is complemented by the commitment from the top down. That's what happened in the state of Maryland, and it's quite frankly what should be happening across the country. And I hope that his partner in this effort, uh, Delegate Shirley Nathan Pulliam, will be here to, to join him when he speaks. And finally, we'll hear from experts in the fourth session, who will, as the session is entitled, Separate Fact from Fiction, who will share their expertise, their research, and their perspectives on why we must work together to save Medicaid, a public health program that is critically important to health equity and remains very vulnerable despite the Supreme Court ruling on the Affordable Care Act. And I'm probably in because of the way that ruling came down. So we have a full agenda. I'm really thankful that our nation's premier experts and leaders are joining us today. I hope that when we adjourn the 2012 Fall Health Brain Trust, we all leave here reinvigorated, recommitted, and even better informed to take all of the information that we share here today back to our communities, to our organizations, to, our in, to take our individual and collective health ef equity efforts several significant steps forward. So at this point, um, I, th I think we're all ready to get started. So let me hand this over to two great friends of the Congressional Black Caucus Health Brain Trust, Larry Lucas from WLL Government Affairs and Connie Bush from Abbott, who join me in welcoming you. Additionally, Larry is a past recipient of a CBC Health Brain Trust Lifetime Achievement Award. He'll talk briefly about the continued importance of Part D in the efforts to eliminate health disparities, and Connie will talk to us briefly about an exciting new effort that Abbott is sponsoring to leverage the role that OBGYNs can play in efforts to increase rates of screening for heart disease and related conditions among women who are at greatest risk. Should ladies go first? <laughs> okay. Help me Thank welcome you. Connie Bush. Good morning. Good morning. I would like to thank you, Congresswoman Christensen and Dr. Britt Weinstock for convening another informative brain trust. Also, before I start, I would like to introduce the Abbott team that is here. Jerry Ann Johnson, who is the director for our vascular, Abbott Vascular, and Latanya Armstrong and Catherine Dratz. Would you please stand? Thank you. We are very appreciative today for this opportunity to share with you information on a very exciting initiative from Abbott, a program focused on heart disease. First of all, I'm going to share with you some vital statistics. Heart disease kill is the number one killer of women. Since 1984, studies have shown that heart disease, also known as cardiovascular disease, kills more women than men every year. In 2007, one woman died per minute in the U.S., approximately 421,000 deaths. In 2010, roughly 40,000 women died of cancer. That is greater than tenfold. 42 million women are living with or at risk for heart disease. 55 more women than men die from stroke by the age of 75. Significantly more African-American women than white women die from breast cancer. Deaths from heart disease occur 11 times more than breast, breast cancer. Of the women who survive a heart attack, nearly half of them will be disabled by heart disease within six years. Women are more likely to die in a year of a heart attack than their male counterparts. According to the American Heart Association, our cardiovascular disease together were estimated to cost $475 billion. These are very vital statistics. And if we do nothing to prevent the escalation of cardiovascular disease in women, it will cost the world over the next 25 years $47 trillion. So now that I have your attention... I would like to share with you an initiative that is positively impacting these statistics. 
Abbott's Women Heart Health Initiative was developed to advance awareness, promote education, provide screening and treatment of women in underserved populations with cardiovascular disease. The Women Heart Health Initiative partners with medical societies, healthcare providers, advocacy groups such as Women Heart, women in government, professional organizations such as the Association of Black Cardiologists, and public groups around the world with the aim to help advance critical educational programs for women and their primary care physicians. The programs provide educational tools for patients, health care providers to highlight this problem, and has developed a novel screening tool to approach early intervention. In partnership with the Society of Cardiovascular Angiographic and Interventions Women in Innovation, a one-page questionnaire was, has been developed for women to complete during their OBGYN visits. And as most women know, um, I do this myself. When I can't get to my primary call, uh, care doctor, I call up my OBGYN and say, okay, I need to do my annual visit. So I use her as my, my, my primary care. Also to share with you, there's a growing body of evidence that shows that women have complications during pregnancies are at greater risk for early cardiovascular disease. So by screening these women in their offices, we have an opportunity to identify the risk of cardiovascular disease. Now the pilot concept is 3,000 women have been screened to date in 16 sites across the U.S., if the tool identifies a certain threshold of risk factors, the women are referred to the appropriate health care provider, typically a cardiologist. At the American College of Cardiology meeting this year in March, data showed that one out of four women screened from the pilot had a risk burden that warranted a referral. The risk to women had a pregnancy complication was even greater. The program, we are happy to say, is being expanded to identify more women at risk for the heart disease, which will be many decades earlier than otherwise identified. So what is important for this initiative? There are many teachable moments that are being created through the study of the of pregnancy complications such as gestational diabetes and hypertension, and they provide an opportunity to discuss and identify possible long-term risks associated with these problems. Studies of the risks and complications enable physicians to help women who are at risk and make critical lifestyle changes, especially when she's expecting a child. So now here's our call for action. One, number one, to increase awareness that heart disease is their our number one killer. To encourage women to talk to their doctors and identify what their risk factors are and then take the appropriate action to lower or eliminate the risk. We want to educate first responders and emergency staff about minimizing door to ECG and cardiac enzyme draw times. Place education materials in mammogram suites. Partner with a local Walgreen for local screenings doing blood pressure Sundays. Develop PSAs with the OBGYNs or CDs. And this would, you can put this in your hospitals or your doctor's offices. Work with faith-based organizations such as health ministry and parish nurse programs to educate their congregation. Abbott Vascular is committed to improving awareness. Abbott is committed to diagnosing and treating women with heart disease through research, collaboration, and key society with other novel pro excuse me, pilot programs. We are so pleased to be working with Congresswoman Christensen in hosting briefings with the Tri-Caucus, patient coalitions, and key stakeholders with the goal of educating and raising the level of awareness over the next few months and into 2003. Thank you very much this morning for your time and attention. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, that's a little weak. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, hey, that's all right. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. Thanks 
for being here to uh, benefit from all the hard work that Congresswoman Christensen and her staff has done in order to make today's event worthwhile. I'm going to just talk briefly this morning about uh, Medicare Part D. In 2003, more than one-third of all Medicare beneficiaries had no prescription drug coverage. The lack of coverage was particularly impactful on low-income seniors and disabled people. Today, that picture has changed dramatically, with more than 90 percent of Medicare beneficiaries, they have that coverage now. But numbers, while they're important, they don't tell the whole story. The Medicare Part D program is succeeding beyond expectations, delivering needed prescription drugs to Medicare beneficiaries at a far lower cost than was expected. Due to strong competition among health plans, that work to keep the costs low, and also the uh, negotiations that's done between the pharmaceutical companies, the savings are great. Surveys show that Medicare Part D enrollees are satisfied with their Part D coverage. 88% of Part D enrollees are satisfied with their coverage, and 95% of these people say that the coverage works very well for them. Despite significant enhancements to the value of the benefits, Part D plans, bids have decreased three years in a row. And actually, they're lower today than the first year that Part D started. And the one point that I wanted to just leave with you, because I knew that uh, we might start a little late and somebody might go a little long, so I was going to be very, very brief. But I'd like for you to make sure that you help our seniors to ensure that they get enrolled in the 2013 Part D enrollment. The open enrollment period will run from October 15th, 2012 through December 7th, 2012. And all changes to Part D during this time period will be effective January 1st, 2013. Thank you. I think the first panel could come up. Thank you very much, Connie and Larry for sharing that with us. I'm going to have the next panel come up and take their seats and um, invite my colleague to, to the podium. I want to first recognize uh, jo, uh, jo Armstrong. I want to recognize both of you, uh, state rep from Tennessee, and I understand the incoming president of the National Black Caucus of State Legislators. And uh, Representative Shirley Nathan Pulliam of Maryland, who I mentioned earlier, who's been very instrumental in ensuring that the state of Maryland uh, pass health disparity elimination laws and, and having them implemented. So, And also in helping us to have your uh, Lieutenant Governor come and speak with us later on. Thank you. Uh, as I promised, yes, give them a round of applause because they do good work. As I promised, Representative Bobby Scott is here with us. He's currently serving his 10th term in the U.S. House of Representatives, where he represents the third district, congressional district of Virginia. He's the first African-American elected to Congress from Virginia since Reconstruction. And currently, uh, Congressman Scott serves on the Committee on Education and Workforce and the Committee on Judiciary, where he's the ranking member, and with your help, uh, will be chair again of the Subcommittee on Crime, Terrorism, and Homeland Security. And prior to Congressman Scott's coming to Congress, he served in the Virginia House of Delegates and also the Virginia State Senate. During his 18-year tenure in Congress, Representative Scott developed a rep reputation as a champion of the U.S. Constitution and Bill of Rights. But he's also consistently fought to protect the rights and civil liberties of all Americans. And he's also become known as a deficit hawk a reputation he developed while serving on the House Budget Committee. He's dedicated to restoring fiscal sanity, sanity, which is really hard to restore in Congress today, to the federal budget process in order to balance the federal budget, and also dedicated to balancing fiscal responsibility with social responsibility. He heads up 
our uh, CBC budget, which we present every year. But today, and very importantly, uh, Representative Scott is known as a stalwart advocate for youth. Since the beginning of his tenure in Congress, Congressman Scott has led efforts to pass comprehensive juvenile justice reform. And when I came, I was pleased to serve with him on the Juvenile Justice Task Force. He's currently seeking bipartisan support for his bill, the Youth Promise Act, which I'm sure he'll share with you, which would provide local community stakeholders with planning, implementation, and assessment grants to develop a comprehensive plan of evidence-based intervention prevention programs to reduce juvenile crime. So help me welcome to open up the, the, next, the first session, Congressman Bobby Scott. Thank, thank you, Donna. And when you talk about health care and the Congressional Black Caucus leadership, who could be a better leader than Dr. Donna Christensen? Give Donna another round of applause for all she does in leading the Congressional Black Caucus. Uh, she has been using her medical background to make sure that our, our recommendations are, are sound and provides excellent leadership. So thank you, Donna, for all that you do. Uh, this panel is uh, called Bullying, Youth Violence, and Suicide, Public Health Challenges Threatening the Nation's Future Leaders. And it's interesting that, um, uh, oh, let me, let me say, say hi to Joe Armstrong, first of all. I was a member of uh, NBCSL for 15 years, and um, it's a great organization. Uh, I loved it, still got friends that were there way back when. Are there other state legislators here? Any other state legislators? Ms. Pulliam? Okay, from uh, from Maryland. Good, to, good, to, good to see you. But thank you for all that you do. The state legislators really work a lot harder than members of Congress. We're full time legislators. I think just about every state legislator is part time, at least part time in salary, full time in work. So thank you, Joe, and all the other state legislators for all that you do. Uh, this uh, session on uh, bullying, youth violence, and suicide, public health challenges, is an important title because it suggests that we ought to look at youth violence from a public health perspective. Now, um, it's not only a public health issue, but we ought to deal with it as a public health issue. Now, uh, if we dealt, we're dealing with crime, uh, we don't usually use it. It's all after the fact, not from a public health perspective. If we use what we do with juvenile crime in, say, how we deal with AIDS, what we would do is spend all our money building cemeteries. And that's essentially what we do with youth violence. We wait until young people uh, start dropping out of school, join a gang, mess up, get caught, and then spend all our time codifying slogans and sound bites as what to do after it's too late. Uh, we now, because of all those slogans, mandatory minimums, three strikes and you're out, trying more juveniles as adults, some of the slogans are so simple, you wonder who could have possibly thought it would do anything about crime. We had a candidate for governor a few years ago in Virginia run, and part of her platform was no cable TV in the prisons. You can just imagine the cable guy showing up, disconnecting the cable, and everybody relaxed, oh, now we're safe. I mean, some of the things you just wonder, most of those have been studied. They do nothing to, to, to crime, but they have got us to the position where we lock up a higher portion of our population than any country on earth by far. Most countries, per 100,000, it's about 50 to 200. The Pew Research Center says that uh, anything over 300, you're starting to get diminishing returns. Over 500, you're locking up so many people, it's actually counterproductive. You're, in, you're adding to crime rather than trying to solve crime over 500. We're at 700 and some per 100,000 in the United States. African Americans, uh, over 2,000 per 100,000. Ten states lock up blacks, almost 4,000 per 100,000. 500 counterproductive. Most countries, uh, 50 to 200. And, and that doesn't come free. It costs a lot of money that could be more productively used, particularly when we know from a public health perspective how to reduce juvenile crime. It has to be a comprehensive approach starting very early, Teen pregnancy prevention, so fewer babies are born into dysfunctional families, prenatal care, so that uh, you can reduce mental retardation and learning disabilities. Home nurse visits have a significant impact in reducing 
Uh, child abuse, which is highly correlated with future crime. Make sure you have um, a WIC funding that's being cut in our but in, in in the Republican budget, so that uh, most of the child's brain growth is done by three years old. Uh, if you haven't, uh, if you have diminution in nutrition during that period of time, you can have lifelong diminution in brain development all the way through, including things like bullying prevention. Uh, which we know how to deal with. There are positive reinforcement to, to deal with bullying. Uh, you can significantly reduce bullying all over, all over the country. There are programs that work, and if you have bullying going on, you're isolating the children. And if you look at those who have committed suicide or those who have committed violence, you look back a couple of years, and almost invariably, you'll find some bullying. So bullying reduction and dismantling what the uh, Children's Events Fund calls the Cradle to, cri to Prison Pipeline, so many of the young people on the way to prison, and construct instead a Cradle to College and Career Pipeline. Actually, by the time you've reduced all the crime and reduced all the social pathology, you're saving more money than you're spending anyway. But that's what we can, we can do uh, if we take a public health perspective. The Youth Promise Act uh, that I've introduced takes that perspective. It requires an evidence-based approach, a comprehensive plan, an evidence-based approach, and we'll fund those uh, programs. Uh, we put evidence-based in the bill, and you say, well, what, as opposed to what? As opposed to the slogans and sound bites that would be codified and put in the plan if we didn't put evidence-based in there. Uh, and as a result of the savings, we ask the people participating to kick back some of the savings to keep the programs running. Uh, they did this in Pennsylvania. Uh, they had a, a program where they funded about 100 different little programs at $60 million. They went back a couple of years later and figured that saved about $300 million, about five to one. Uh, Boston put one together that had about a murder uh, a month uh, for years. They came together as a community comprehensive plan. They went three years without a juvenile, uh, juvenile murder. They did one in Richmond, spent... Uh, Two and a half million dollars uh, with a comprehensive program. They reduced the murders in that area from 19 to two. And if you look at the gunshot wounds that the Medical College of Virginia didn't have to treat, they probably saved the two and a half million dollars right there without uh, counting all the police and courts and prisons you had to spend chasing after people that had committed the crimes. We know we can do better and bullying prevention is uh, one of the critical elements because if we can get rid of bullying, we'll significantly uh, reduce the incidence of crime. Now, a lot of this is money. Uh, we have budget choices to make. And I think the best way I can describe the budget choices is to uh, tell a story that our governor frequently tells about the former chairman of our uh, Senate Finance Committee, um, uh, Ed Willey, who had a well-deserved reputation as a conservative. Very conservative, stingy. Word was you couldn't get a dime out of him with a crowbar. Uh, he went into a bar right before an election, and you could hear the people mumbling. Oh, there was that Ed Willie. Nobody in here going to vote for him. He's too stingy. He can't get a dime out of him with a crowbar. He all heard all this mumbling and uh, turned to the bartender, said, Bartender, everybody quieted down, raises his beer. Bartender, when Ed Willie drinks, everybody drinks. He set up the whole house. People couldn't believe it. They were slapping each other in the back. Everybody had a beer. Oh, they were celebrating. Oh, Ed Willie got my vote. Well, why are you talking bad about Ed Willie? He's all right with me. Oh, they were just celebrating. After a few minutes, Ed Willie finished his beer, took a couple of dollars, put it on the bar, and said, Bartender. Everybody turned to look, said, Bartender, when Ed Willie pays, everybody pays. <laughs> I say this because in 2010, we extended tax cuts to the tune of $4 trillion. Everybody was celebrating. Oh, look what happens when we get together. Isn't it? Oh, bipartisan. Oh, look at us. Oh, slapping each other on the back. Come back in January. Now we got to pay for it. And the people are like, where the, where the Head Start money? Where the, what, what happened to the Pell Grants? Uh, how come we don't have enough money for high-speed rail? All of these, and then you get the sequester foolishness. Uh, the sequester and people saying, hair on fire, we can't afford the defense cuts. We can't afford that. That's, that's one trillion. We, we extended four trillion dollars in tax cuts. Now, the Congressional Black Caucus budget was very responsible, had numbers on line items, unlike the Republican budget that had asterisks on line items. They said we're going to reduce taxes and then asterisk, uh, revenue neutral, four trillion dollars. 
They can't suffer the one trillion. They got hair on fire running all over the country about the defense part of the sequester. That's the first trillion. And if you want to know what a trillion dollars in tax cuts looks like, uh, in spending cuts looks like, let me tell you what it looks like. It looks like the sequester. That's a trillion dollars. If you can't stand that, just shut up about reduce the size of government with $4 trillion in unspecified cuts because you'll never get around to specifying them. But we have choices to make, and if we don't make the right choices, the first thing to go would be Medicare, and you know that's on the chopping block, then Social Security, then all of the other programs that we've been working so hard to, 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 uh, to, to fund. We have those choices to make, and some of those choices need to be investing in the public health uh, strategy and dealing with juvenile justice. And since we're talking about health care, I just simply say one last word about Medicare, because these guys are protecting Medicare just like Colonel Sanders is protecting the chickens. Um, <laughs> they protect people over 55. That's their say. So everybody over, everybody better known as people paying attention to it. So they're supposed to go to sleep and not worry about it. Let me tell you something. First thing that ought to occur to people is how bad a plan is it that people need protecting from it? Then you wonder, well, if I need protection, who's going to be there to protect me? If you're 55, you're going to need Medicare to be there 30 years from now. If Governor Romney is elected, he's going to be here and gone in eight years. Who's going to be doing all the protecting? And finally, this, the dirty little secret is they're not even protecting people over 55. People over 55, people on Medicare today get free free. Uh, annual checkups and cancer screenings, no copay and deductible. Under their plan, you're going to start paying the copays and deductibles again. Uh, if you um, were closing the donut hole, their plan is to reopen the donut hole. Uh, the way they got this thing constructed, the costs are going to go up, so your copays are going up. So your copays are going up, you lose your free uh, prevention, the donut hole is reopening. Then they complain that the Democrats' Medicare strategy, the thing will go broke in 12 years. What you don't hear is theirs goes broke in four years. You get worse services and it goes broke quicker. Uh, that's for the people that they're protecting. Under 55, just remember the one number, 6,400. That's how much money every year you're going to be paying if you get sick under their plan than if you had, instead of that piece of voucher, you had a real Medicare card. Uh, so when they start talking about protecting Medicare, uh, we have been, unfortunately, a little inarticulate in describing how bad a plan they've got. Uh, but we need to make sure that people understand what's going on uh, so that uh, they will know how to vote in November, particularly in Florida, uh, where Medicare is uh, probably more of an issue than anywhere else. And finally, Don, I want to thank you for all that you do, particularly just the title of this session, which is Bullying, Youth Violence, and Suicide, Public Health Challenges Threatening the Nation's Future Leaders, because we need to deal with this problem from a public health perspective. Thank you very much, Don. Thank you. Ms. Mrs. Rachel Davis is the Managing Director at the Prevention Institute, which will focus on, and she'll focus on youth violence as a preventable problem which fundamentally impacts young people and their communities. Solutions and successes in preventing violence will also be highlighted. Dr. Sherry Mullock is the Associate Professor of Cl Clinical Psychology at George Washington University. Dr. Mullock will focus on sui suicidality cultural factors in suicide, and issues that need to be more consistently and delicately addressed as it pertains to suicide in racial and ethnic minority communities, particularly among young people. Dr. Joseph L. Wright uh, is a professor and senior vice president at Children's National Medical Center. Uh, Ms. Mullock will share her experiences being bullied in high school and the impact it had on her, as well as her ideas about how to better prevent bullying. Um, there will also be a special presentation from Mr. Timothy Porter. Uh, Mr. Timothy Porter is the CEO of AppDiction Studio, a company specializing in smartphone application development. Um, Mr. Porter will deliver a special presentation about a new app entitled Stop Bullies. This app allows bullying victims and bystanders to anonymously alert school administrators, parents, and public safety officials to bullying activity. I want to thank uh, Congresswoman Christensen for uh, inviting me here to be 
uh, today. It's really an honor to be here, and um, and I really want to thank you for your commitment and conviction about addressing health inequities um, and eliminating them, and also including violence as a piece of that, because violence is really a significant health inequity. Um, and I'm going to talk about the impacts of violence on our young people and communities, and also what we've learned through um, the research and practice of advancing a public health approach. I want to start in Oakland, where I live and work. Um, this is from a San Francisco Chronicle article, and what this says is life in the killing zone. Growing Violence is the most pervasive part of growing up in East Oakland the most pervasive part. And that has real consequences for the young people growing up there. And as Congressman Scott already has said, what we tend to do is wait. And we don't do anything early on. And then we end up with young people we call wild in the streets. We're afraid of them. We're not putting in the policies to give them hope and opportunity, but we're putting in the policies that are incarcerating them at higher rates than any other place in the world. But violence is a public health issue. It's a leading cause of injury, premature uh, death, and disability. It's also a significant disparity. Young people and people of color are disproportionately affected by violence and violence increases the risk of other poor health outcomes. For example, we know that there's links between violence and chronic disease. Both violence and the fear of violence can affect individual behaviors related to healthy eating and active living and can also diminish the community environment. So for example, supermarkets don't want to locate in neighborhoods that are perceived to be unsafe. We studied this issue with uh, practitioners in communities that were working on healthy eating and active living initiatives, um, and they saw this as a real barrier, particularly in low-income communities and communities of color. Community leaders talked about things like turf wars deterring people from walking to grocery stores, and violence having a big impact on the use of parks. People are afraid to exercise there. We also know there's links between violence and mental health, and I won't go through all of them. You have a lot of fact sheets about these links in your packets, but we know that young people who are exposed to violence are at significantly higher risk for post-traumatic stress disorder, which is um, now um, looking much more like chronic uh, stress disorder, major depressive episodes, and substance abuse and dependence. We also know there's links between violence and other issues like learning. For example, violence and the fear of violence impacts school performance, attendance, and graduation rates. And violence costs us a lot. In the medical system, and this is, um, these are from studies that came out in 2000, um, or 2007 based on 2000 data, so I think CDC is working on updating these. But in 2000 in the U.S., violence-related injuries cost $5.6 billion in medical treatment. The total lifetime costs, medical costs for injuries from interpersonal violence was $4.28 billion, and the medical treatment from self-inflicted injuries was $1.8 billion. In 2005 in LA, the medical costs were $56.6 million for gang-related violence. Um, and the costs are more in the criminal justice system. For example, um, when Los Angeles did a cost-benefit analysis as part of putting together its comprehensive gang strategy, they found that in one year, the city, county, and state costs in the criminal justice system from gang violence was $1.14 billion. And the costs for incarceration are also enormous. So the American Correctional Association says, on average, it's $241 a day or $88,000 a year for every youth in a juvenile facility, and that we spend $5.7 billion to imprison almost 65,000 youth in 2007. And the costs go beyond that, reduce tu tourism, reduce neighborhood commercialization, um, loss in private revenues and public tax dollars, and overall reduce quality of life. That's why we need prevention. 
Prevention is a systematic process that reduces the frequency or severity of the illness. And primary prevention can promote healthy environments and behaviors before the risk of violence. And prevention works. There's this funny phenomenon in prevention when we've already prevented something, people say, oh, that was easy. But this other thing, it's impossible. And I want you to know that from this list, tens of thousands and millions of lives have been saved or improved because of these public health interventions. And in most cases, before we did it, people said, that's impossible. So, um, but what happened in each of these was often organizational practice and policy changes that resulted in norms change. And that's what we need to do with violence because the ideas of one generation become the instincts of the next. And we know violence is learned. This photo from Sarajevo when little boys had spent months um, locked up in their homes with a war going on in the front streets. They, when they finally had a chance to go out and play, they didn't play duck, duck, goose. They played war. Violence is learned. And so it's not surprising that if violence is the most pervasive part of growing up, that people are at ri these young people are at risk for perpetration and victimization of violence. And the question is, can we end the epidemic? What we know from public health is no epidemic has ever been resolved by paying attention to the treatment of the affected individual. That's why we need a public health approach population-based, focused on the community, and focused on prevention, which means reducing the risk factors that increase the likelihood of violence and increasing the protective factors. And increasingly, folks in the criminal justice world are looking at it this way, too. Our Attorney General in, in California, Kamala Harris, has said, let's think of crime as an epidemic. It should be understood as something we can prevent if we focus on the early indicators. It doesn't take a rocket scientist or a genius to predict who's going to end up being a victim of crime or a perpetrator. So we're working across the country in a national initiative called Unity. We build, build support for effective, scalable, sustainable efforts to prevent youth violence before it occurs so that young people can thrive in safe environments with ample opportunities and supportive relationships. And I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing and what we've learned. We're funded largely by Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We work with Harvard School of Public Health and UCLA, and we work with a number of cities around the country. Um, to guide effective and sustainable practice, to make the case for a public health approach, and to educate decision makers and inform national strategies. We're working with a number of cities around the country, and we've worked with them to develop the list of what cities need to prevent violence before it occurs and match it up against the research. These are the kinds of strategies that, if are put in place in scale in cities, can significantly reduce violence. Let me give you a couple examples. Cure Violence, um, which was formerly Chicago Ceasefire, has demonstrated 41 to 73 percent reductions in shootings and killings and a 100 percent drop in retaliation murders. This strategy is in place in a growing number of places, Baltimore, Kansas City, a number of cities in New York, and Chicago. School, universal school-based violence prevention strategies can reduce violence by 15% in as little as six months. But City said we also need to deal with our local issues and put in local strategies that meet our needs too. And they came up with this list of the other things that, the other options. So in Los Angeles, for example, where they've put in summer night lights, taking back the parks from gangs, and employing former gang members, they've seen a 57% reduction in gang-related homicides citywide through summer night lights. But we also know it's not just any one strategy or program. Cities need a comprehensive plan um, with um, coordinated efforts across sectors. In Minneapolis, they have a four-point public health-based plan connecting young people to caring adults, intervening at the first sign of risk, restoring youth who have gone down the wrong path, and unlearning the culture of violence. 
When they first put this in place, they put it in the five neighborhoods with the highest violence rates in Minneapolis, and within two years, they had 40% drops in juvenile justice uh, crime rates. As they've increased to 22 neighborhoods over six years now, they've seen those drops sustained, and they've seen them replicated in other neighborhoods, looking at a 64% decrease in homicides of young people aged 15 to 24, and that the number of youth suspects involved in violent crimes has dropped by 62%. What I want to leave you with is that we can prevent violence. Our Unity co-chair, Dr. Deborah Prothrow's death, gives us some of the answers here. Violence is not the problem of one neighborhood or group. Coming together and owning this problem and the solutions are central. We all must come together to make this a critical priority for our young people, and we must. As Connie Rice, who's a director at the LA Advancement Project and author of Power Concedes Nothing, has said, the first of all freedoms is freedom from violence, and the first of all rights must be the right to safety. We have a lot of information um, and that um, you can find on our website, so I want to leave you with uh, my contact information and really with the message that we can prevent this problem and provide hope and opportunity for young people. Thank you. Okay, first of all, I want to also thank Dr. Christensen and uh, Dr. Weinstock for inviting us here this morning. As um, um, Dean introduced me, I'm Sherry Davis-Smolock. I'm a professor at George Washington University. And my primary area of research is developing suicide prevention programs, particularly in communities of faith. And so I'm going to be talking with you a little bit about um, suicide risk, particularly in the African-American youth. And I'm also going to talk about some suggestions for solutions to this problem. OK, so the challenge is that every 16 minutes, someone dies from suicide. In 2007, over 33,000 people died from suicide in the United States. Suicide is the 11th leading cause of death in the United States. And suicide is the third leading cause of death among African-American youth between the ages of 15 and 24. Between 7 and 9% of high school age students attempt suicide in the United States each year. Suicide is the second or third leading cause of death, depending on the study that you look at amongst college students. And so for me, the thing that always really um, motivates me to do the work that I do, both as a researcher and also clinically, is that the three leading causes of death for youth between 15 and 24, which are homicides, accidents, and suicides, are all preventable. And so that, every time I see the statistic, I get angry, because I think there's something that we as a community at large need to do something about, because as everyone has been saying this morning, our youth are our future. These are just some more statistics um, that come from the CDC, the National Youth Risk Behavior Survey, which is a survey that's completed in high schools every year in a representative sample around the country. And just to give you a sense of how pervasive this is, you can see that about 33.9% of females who are in high school report feeling sad or hopeless most of the time within the last two weeks. Um, if you look at those figures between what, uh, looking on the, my uh, left and your right, you can see that the figures for white, black, and Hispanic youth are between 23 and 31 percent. The differences between the white and black groups are not statistically significant, and it is a statistically difference, a significant difference with the Hispanic youth. This is looking at um, high school students who seriously considered attempting suicide. Again, females. 17.4%, males 10.5%. Again, looking at there's not much difference between the black and white youth and Hispanic youth are, are higher, significantly higher. This is feeling this way, thinking about an attempt in the last 12 months. And then the percentage of high school students who actually make an attempt, again, females are significantly more likely across all age groups to make suicide attempts. <laughs> And you'll see that for the last few years now, African-American youth um, suicide attempt rates have actually been higher than those for white youth. And most of what drives that is African-American males. In the Latino community, most of what drives that is females. So 
That's the bad news and that's the challenge. The good news is that we can all do something to help prevent suicide. I think the entire panel is going to be talking about prevention, 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 because it's, it's such so much more cost effective to stop a problem before it occurs and to try to fix it after the fact. It's kind of like if you think about if you have a, that's why we repair our roofs and do lots of things in our, in our homes and our cars. We get tune-ups, right, so that we don't have to pay $2,000 for a transmission if we just keep our cars up. So one of the things that we know is knowing the warning signs are helpful, but that alone is not enough. We all know, those of us who work in prevention science, that awareness by itself is not enough. Linking people to treatment is very important. And um, particularly in the work that I do, giving people permission to seek help, because even if everyone had access to care, we know that particularly amongst young people, there are norms and value systems that do not promote seeking help. This is particularly true amongst our young males. And so part of what we have to also do is create environments where young people feel it is comfortable and safe and okay for them to ask for help. And then also making sure that we encourage legislation that, that ensures access to care. I wanted to spend just a few moments um, talking about depression because I think in my own work, most people don't, aren't aware of the symptoms of depression. And there are a lot of people walking around who don't, are not even aware that they are depressed. So depression is a common disorder and it's a, a high risk factor of suicide, which is why I'm talking about it. It will affect about one in five people or 20% of the people in the United States in their lifetime. It is the number one disabling disorder in the world. So this cause, depression causes more disability than heart disease and cancer and HIV AIDS. It is more common in women than men. It is a recurrent illness, which I think also many people don't realize that each time you have a depressive episode, your risk for having another one goes up. So that particularly for young people, the earlier the age of onset with depressive symptoms and the more rapidly they repeat each other, the more at risk they are for having another episode. I want to spend just a minute also talking about, because people often ask me, what's the difference between normal sadness and clinical depression? So you'll see on one side that the feelings about normal sadness is feeling sad, but also having feelings of, of what we call quote-unquote normal, the ability to experience joy, a range of emotions, joy, happiness, sadness, having what we call emotional reactivity so that when something happy happens, you respond to that appropriately, and when something sad happens, you respond to that appropriately. And if you have your eating or sleeping behaviors affected, it's not affected for a long period of time. On the other hand, people who are clinically depressed will have a sad or depressed mood most of the time for at least two weeks, have something called anhedonia, which is a lack of motivation to do things that you used to find fun or pleasurable activities, a sense of hopelessness, helplessness, loss of mood reactivity, and sometimes people have difficulty sleeping and eating. Some people sleep too much and overeat, and other people um, have difficulty either falling asleep or will fall asleep and then wake up in the morning and it's at early hours of the morning, two or three, and have difficulty falling back to sleep. Also being chronically fatigued, not having enough energy. And then, um, and also if some people experience suicidal thoughts as well. Okay, what are suicidal thoughts? I don't assume that we all know what that is, so I just gave you a brief definition. These are thoughts and ideas about taking one's life, and these thoughts can range from very vague plans, like, I just don't want to be here anymore, to something very specific, like the person has a specific plan, they have a method that they're going to use, they've planned perhaps um, to do something to themselves when people are out of town or isolated, and the more specific the plan then the more difficult, the more um, concerned we are about the attempts. And then we have suicide attempts, which are people who engage in behaviors. And this is really important, where there's a deliberate attempt to take your life. There are also other behaviors that young people often engage in called self-mutilation or self-harming behavior. For example, cutting. Those are things that sometimes young people do to, to relieve anxiety, but the intention is not to kill oneself. Okay, there are cultural differences in expression of suicide. This is actually a handout in your folder. I'm going to skip through some of this because I've just been told I have five minutes to go. Here are some risk factors, previous attempts, depression, delinquent behavior, substance abuse, recent loss, non-supportive families, feeling isolated from others, um, having access to highly lethal methods and barriers to access to care, Protective factors, which are really important because when we develop a prevention program, you want to minimize risk factors, but as my colleague said, also enhance or increase protective factors. So good coping skills, active use of faith, beliefs, and coping, having a supportive family. Parental monitoring is very critical. Uh, belonging to a church, having cultural beliefs that discourage suicide. 
There are a number of approaches to suicide prevention. There are school-based awareness programs. There are screenings, gatekeeper programs. Gatekeepers are people who have normal interactions with youth and are trusted youth uh, people in their community. And these are people that you can actually train to look for the warning signs and link young people to um, services. Crisis centers and hotlines are very effective in working with people who are in immediate crisis. Restricting access to means is important. Media presentation of suicides is particularly important. And giving youth who are at risk skills training. Okay, so what can you do to help? Really important if someone, a young person comes to you, listen, don't be judgmental. Take every complaint seriously. Trust your own judgment. Don't be afraid to ask questions. One thing that we often think if we ask someone about suicide, we're going to make them make an attempt. That's not true. Most young people are relieved that they can finally talk to someone about the things that they've been thinking about. Don't act shocked or upset. Don't be misled. Sometimes kids will say, I'm just playing or, you know, psych, jack, whatever. Don't take, if someone has said something, please take it seriously. Be affirming and supportive. Evaluate available resources. Be specific and do something tangible. In my own college experience, I have literally walked young people to the counseling center. So sometimes I will say with them, I'm not going to leave you until we have a resolution right now to how you're feeling. And if that means I have to sit with you for an hour, I'll sit with you for an hour. If that means I have to walk you personally to the counseling center, I'm willing to do that. Get appropriate help in consultation. Don't handle the crisis alone. In acute crises, don't leave the person alone. Um, give family members, colleagues, and friends, again, permission to seek help. Creating warm and accepting environments to discuss emotional challenges and concerns. Particularly in the African-American community, we need to stop encouraging the fake it till you make it kind of functioning. We all kind of go through that. As African-Americans, sometimes we're stoic and we're strong and we don't really need a shoulder to cry on. And it's nothing further from the truth. Create support systems in schools, churches, and family and youth centers. The bottom line is it's going to take all of us. It's not one solution. It's not the school's responsibility. It's not the church's responsibility. It's not the family's responsibility. It's all of us together as a community. Um, and so these are just some more ideas for um, programs that you can do to enhance particularly protective factors. And so the bottom line is we can all do this together. And thank you for your time and your attention. Really important as a pediatrician, I'm very uh, uh, pleased that we have uh, a young person on our panel, so I'm going to make sure that we have um, time to hear from her, so I will move quickly here. Um, the title of my presentation is The uh, Bullying the Impact on Children's Health, but really the question that I'd like to pose to you all, and the congressman uh, um, teed this up, uh, is bullying the tip of the intentional injury iceberg. Um, I have nothing, no conflicts of interest to disclose, but I do want to uh, make mention of the many areas of activity uh, around uh, bullying prevention that are, are going on around the country. Uh, my own professional organization, the American Academy of Pediatrics, has, has taken this on and then included in your materials as a, a policy statement about what child health professionals can and should be doing about this issue. I want to acknowledge our colleagues here from the state of Maryland. The Maryland legislature has passed um, uh, two important pieces of anti-bullying legislation that are, are being implemented by the Maryland State Department of Education. At the federal level, um, uh, the president has charged uh, um, uh, Secretary Duncan at the Department of Education to pull together all the federal partners uh, that are involved in this work. And uh, we just um, had the third annual uh, Federal Partners in Bullying Prevention um, uh, meeting in August. And I'll share a little bit of the uh, research from that meeting as well. The Congress on, on June 28th uh, launched the Anti-Bullying Caucus. And I'm, I'm pleased to share that uh, several members of the uh, CBC are part of that caucus. And I remember that date, June 28th, because that was the afternoon of the Supreme Court decision. So there was a, a lot of activity on the Hill on that day. And lastly, Sesame Street. For those of you who may be parents of preschool or grandparents, Sesame Street has gotten into the primary prevention of bullying. And this is very important because what you've heard and all that we're talking about is largely secondary prevention. Something has had to happen in order for someone to get in front of me, certainly. Um, and uh, Sesame Street has taken a, a, a different tack. Their audience, obviously, are, are uh, preschool children between three and five and their parents. Uh, 
And um, they launched the uh, an anti-bullying initiative through programming, which was very clever because the victim was Big Bird. So the biggest uh, character on the set uh, was the victim, and uh, he was being bullied by a, a character that I'm not familiar with, but a, a Blue Jay who's about that big. Um, so um, if you stay tuned to that, that's very important work that Sesame Street is, is doing. Now, I, I practice right up the street. Children's National Medical Center is the third oldest children's hospital in the United States. We have among the busiest emergency departments in the country. I, I'm a pediatric emergency physician with over 100,000 visits a year, and many of those children are coming through as, as victims of assault. And this is what got my attention, I'll, and uh, bear with me, I'll just uh, uh, paraphrase this for you, but this is what I have felt for many years in, in my practice. A man is standing by a river when he hears a cry for help. He sees someone struggling in the water on the verge of drowning. Being an expert swimmer, he jumps in and rescues the victim. Before he has time to rejoice in his success, however, he sees someone else floating by, also crying for help. As soon as he rescues this person, he discovers a third, a fourth, and a fifth. More and more victims float by, taxing his swimming stamina. Finally, he walks away. When asked where he's going, he replies, I'm going up the river to stop people from falling in. And this is what prevention is all about, is getting upstream, getting upstream to make a difference. This is what the congressman was talking about in his, his opening remarks. We well know the factors that put young people at risk. Uh, you've already heard from our previous speakers. Uh, it's a, 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 a recidivist cycle here that re results only uh, can come through behavior change or, um, or, or resulting in death. And I've seen far too, many of, too much of that in my practice. So the question becomes, in getting upstream, in getting upstream and, and, and tackling the antecedents to why people uh, young people are appearing in front of me in an emergency department or uh, are, are involved in more serious violence. We really need to address bullying. But in this country, in this country as recently as a decade ago, this is a uh, editorial from the Journal of the American Medical Association. There had been no studies, no studies that had examined the relationship of bullying and being bullied with risk for more serious violence. Uh, this is an editorial actually um, authored by uh, uh, Dr. Deborah Prothrow-Stiff. And uh, we are behind, we are behind in the United States with regard to uh, recognizing the impact of bullying behavior on our young folks. So very quickly, I, I'm going to make the point that bullying is a component of overall violence prevention. And I really want to share with you some of the emerging areas and frontiers for expression. We, uh, the young people are ahead of us on this. The technology uh, is uh, preventing new avenues for, for bullying expression each and every day. So in terms of very quickly definition, uh, is a form of aggression where one or more children repeatedly, intentionally, uh, uh, harass or physically harm a young person who is perceived as unable to defend him or herself. Let's break that down for a moment. The key features, repetition, intent, imbalance of power. Imbalance of power can be physical, emotional, or social. Very important to understand that. Forms of bullying, direct versus indirect. And I point this out because there is a gender distinction in the way that young people bully one another. Uh, boys are more typically involved with direct forms of bullying girls and indirect, but there's a great deal of overlap. And in fact, one of the emerging frontiers is, girl, is girls being involved in more direct bullying. And I'll talk about how that affects uh, young women in a moment. Um, roughly, and this is true uh, regardless of ethnicity, uh, anywhere between 20 and 25 percent uh, of children are involved in some way in bullying as a bully or a victim. Uh, the um, important thing I want you to take away here is that among the most common forms of expression of bullying, three of the top four fall into that category of indirect bullying. Now, why is that important? Well, indirect bullying is much harder to detect, much more insidious, and have more long-lasting outcomes. And here, when you include the role of bystanders, children who may not be directly involved, uh, but are bystanders, three quarters of third grade children are somewhere in this bullying circle. So this is a pervasive issue. This is not an issue of just a few children. 
This is something that affects each and every one of our children and our grandchildren as they move through um, uh, elementary school. Mind you, this is a statistic that is germane to third graders. So the question I get all the time, Dr. Wright, well, so what's all the fuss? What's the big deal? Isn't this just kids being kids? Well, the issue of emerging concern is the association of this behavior, uh, particularly among young school-aged children with the subsequent development of serious assault behaviors and deleterious health consequences down the line. Um, and if you look at this um, Secret Service, Secret Service meta-analysis, after Columbine, the Secret Service was uh, tasked with looking at all of the episodes over a, a 30 year period involving um, uh, uh, mass attacks. And in two thirds of the cases, in two thirds of the cases, the attacker had felt persecuted, threatened, attacked, or injured before the incident. And when uh, we looked at this issue of retaliation in our own practice, uh, largely African-American uh, young people coming into our emergency department here in Washington, D.C., we asked the question about revenge. 64% disagreed with the statement, I believe that revenge is a good thing. However, when we asked them, what would you do if someone hit you? 77% said I'd hit them back. And what we learned in that analysis is that the overwhelming single greatest impact of young people's attitudes about retaliation is their parents. What would my parent want me to do? So this is where we have a real challenge with regard to tackling bullying prevention because so many of us grew up with a very different attitude about this issue. I know I certainly did. Um, when I came home and, and, and uh, told my father that somebody hit me well, I got that response, you hit him back. So this is a challenge for us moving forward. Um, I wanna just uh, quickly talk a little bit. You've heard about um, uh, the uh, behavioral health consequences uh, that um, um, impact our young people. Uh, I want to also point out that bullying uh, is a contributor certainly to depression. Uh, here, this is a study done by our, our child psychiatry group at our hospital uh, where we actually have enough business to run a clinic, a separate clinic on the health consequences of bullying. And um, when you look at the gender distinction between boys and girls, there are associations for depression and suicidal ideation that are greater for indirect forms, young girls, than for direct forms of bullying. And what's very interesting is that no matter what form of bullying, indirect or direct, that girls are involved with, the linkage with depression and suicidal, suicidal, suicidal ideation persists. And this is very interesting it seems that boys who are involved in direct bullying are able to um, uh, fight and get it out. There, there, there is not the same degree of consequence with regard to behavioral um, uh, impact on boys who are involved in direct bullying. Yet, uh, when girls are involved, no matter what the form, direct or indirect, there is this association with depression and suicidal ideation. Okay, I want to leave you with the emerging frontiers because this is very important, because we, as the adults in the room, need to understand uh, what our young folks are involved with. There is actually a video game called Bully that is marketed by Rockstar. Rockstar is the same company, it's a British company, that um, produces the um, 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 Grand Theft Auto series. There are several versions of that, that particular series. Uh, we tamped this down a few years back and then they went underground and, and released a stealth campaign and got the thing into, um, into the video stores and it's currently, this is the cover from that, um, that game. Also, cyberbullying. Uh, I think we're all familiar with the use and abuse of technology as a form of, um, of uh, bullying that young people are involved with. Sexting uh, is uh, the uh, abuse through the use of sexual imaging. And I just want to show you one slide here about cyberbullying. It's very interesting to me that uh, typically the relationship between the uh, 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 victim and the assailant in, in violent episodes is one where the individuals know one another uh, overwhelmingly. But with cyberbullying, with cyberbullying, we have a very high incidence of stranger, stranger identity among those kids who are being cyberbullied. Well, why is that? Well, the anonymity. 
The anonymity allows for folks to do things that they would normally not do uh, if they were face to face with the person. Um, this is a study that was just released this month on sexting, sexting simply being the, uh, the, the transmission or receipt of sexual images through the uh, texting technology. 15% of high school students who study out of California uh, had uh, sent or received a, a, a sext, and 54% were aware of others who are involved in sexting. And when they looked at the behavior of children who were involved in sexting, there's a higher likelihood of being sexually active and being unprotected at last encounter. This is the first study that really has taken this deep dive into the issue of sexting. Um, and this study is almost also published this month, which is the first look at uh, distinction among, um, among groups. And what I wanted to have you take away from this work, this work's done by uh, Robert Farris, uh, with whom I presented at the um, most recent federal uh, partners meeting, talked about that young people um, usually bully within their peer group. So African-American children are bullying African-American children. And the concepts of connectivity and who they bully is uh, all framed around uh, concepts around selective bridging, who is the, the, the elite in the group. And, and this image is a, a very interesting analysis of the kind of like the bullying circle I showed earlier, where um, uh, it's a very uh, uh, complicated dynamic, but one that is usually contained within the peer group. So there's very little... Um, uh, bullying across ethnic groups, and this is something that uh, deserves a little bit more attention. So uh, what are we to do? There is activity that I would encourage all of you all to press your health care providers, especially pediatricians. Why? Because particularly early in life, the health care provider of greatest contact for a family is a pediatrician. You're going for longitudinal care, you're going for shots, and we have an obligation to uh, incorporate this into our anticipatory guidance that um, is part of uh, practice. I wanna show you this map because this is an area of opportunity. This map represents the states in which there is a requirement for professional development for educators, teachers around bullying. The um, uh, red indicates the states in the, in the country where there is no requirement for anti-bullying, professional development, or training for, for teachers. This is an opportunity area. I know that I would be willing and my colleagues would be willing to attack those areas in red as a way to really uh, raise awareness on the issue. So uh, again, the bottom line is you cannot separate bullying from a comprehensive approach to youth violence prevention, and I thank you for your attention. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, please bear with me because I'm very nervous. I'm excited to be here. Um, so my name is Diara Moloch, and I am in my first year of college um, at Elizabethtown. And I'm here to talk to you about my experience in high school. Um, my experience with being bullied didn't start in high school. I was teased often in um, elementary school to middle school, but it was not at the level that I felt, you know, depressed in high school. Um, you know, I'm not, I was, I wasn't, in my school, it was very clicky. And, you know, I was never part of the popular crowd. I had my own group of friends, and that was it. Everybody had their own group of friends, and they stayed there, and nobody moved out of their circles. And, the, you know, popular kids were the pretty girls that had the, um, you know, skinny and had the long, you know, flowing hair. And, you know, I obviously I don't fit that profile. I have, you know, natural hair. Um, I'm not, I'm, a, I'm overweight. Um... I don't, I don't wear makeup. I don't wear jewelry. I didn't do anything to enhance my futures. So I didn't fit the profile what popularity was and still is in a lot of um, high schools today. Um, um, I was often teased, you know, people walking by. Some people I don't even know, you know, say, um, called me ugly, called me names, often laughed at me. I got, it got so bad to the point that I just, 
when I would walk down the hall in the morning, I would um, put in earphones to listen to music because when I uh, heard people laughing, I assumed that they were laughing at me. I became so paranoid. Everything became about me, me, me. They must be talking about me. So I became so paranoid that music became something that helped me. Um, I think, you know, the biggest problem is that when you don't say anything, people are going to keep doing it because you're not standing up for yourself. And I had a breaking point. I think it was my junior year, midway through my junior year. And what happened was I'm on the track team. Um, I was on the track team and um, I was a thrower. And the cool people were all the sprinters and the long distance people. That's what people paid attention to. The throwers were for the fat people who couldn't run. That's what people saw it as. And anybody who knows track and field knows how hard throwing events can be and how technical, how difficult it is. So I didn't appreciate that. So on the track team, also very clickish. We had often had meets that were far away because there aren't a lot of indoor tracks in this area. So I went out of town and so my parents, you know, I don't want to go. I'm tired of this. I don't want to be on this team anymore. And so they said, well, DR, well, just go to this meet. Just go to this one meet, and we'll try to get you help. And so I went to this track meet. And I was, um, the, the meets, how they work, most of them don't have stands on the side. The athletes have to sit on the inside where the basketball court is and the track is around. So everybody's settled on the inside. So I was laying down, just minding my business. I was done for the day. I had done all my events. And I was just sleeping, minding my business. I wasn't bothering anybody. I didn't say anything to anybody. And there were a group of kids who were tight on the team, and they were sitting very close to me, and they, you know, started gossiping about people. And I heard my name come up. And so I had the cover over me when I was laying down, so I didn't know I was listening. And they were talking about me, and I remember this guy, who's also a thrower, was very popular, and he was talking about something that I had told him in confidence, and he was telling them what I said. And they were just making fun of me and laughing, and he really um, re- reinterpreted the story to make it funny. And I think it was the first time I said something. And so I sat up and I said, you know, I can hear you. I'm right here. So it just looked at me like, so what? What are you going to do? And so I didn't do anything. You know, I had never stood up for myself. So I think past saying something, I had no idea what to do. And I'm not a violent person. I'm not you know, a person to get up in people's faces. So I just lay back down. They continue to mock me. And then I don't know why this happened. They started throwing stuff at me. They start throwing anything they can find, like chips and wrappers and pens, because people often do their homework there, books. Um, a shoe was thrown at me. And it's amazing because track meets are very crowded. There's at least use about 15, 20 other teams, and we're all sitting within close distance. And about, you know... How many hundreds of kids are there and that nobody did anything? I thought that was so amazing. I couldn't believe that nobody would say anything. All those other track teams, people on my team, the coaches, nobody said anything. And so, you know, I called my parents and I, I went home and I told them what happened and I just, I just had the longest night and I cried and cried and cried. And so I told my parents that I think that I'm depressed. And my parents already knew that I was depressed, but I don't think I had ever admitted it to myself. And so one thing that's really important is that you can't, you can only help, you really can't help people unless they want to be helped. It's really important to acknowledge the fact that if you are in any um, situations, that if you're depressed to say something to somebody or anybody. And so it took a while but after about three weeks, my parents finally got me a counselor, and I started going, and I was in counseling for about a month and a half before I went to college, and it helped so much. It really helped me tremendously. Um, you know, it's going to counseling should never be a shameful thing. A lot of people think it's, you know, they associate counseling with negativity, and there's nothing wrong with admitting that you need help. Um, you know, there's a lot of methods that you can work with. Like my counselor with me, she, she made me write every time something positive happened in my day, I had to write it in a journal. And when you do things like that, you realize how much in your life that, how much positivity there is in your life. And you realize, you weigh the positive more than negative, negative. And, um, 
<laughs> um, so counseling really, really helped me. Um, when I talked to my parents about what happened during the, um, going back to what happened at the track meet, uh, it was the first time my parents said, you know what, <laughs> DR, you can go knock that girl out. <laughs> you know, they were just kidding. I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> so, you know, I finally got the courage and I said, next time she says something, I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to beat her up, but I'm going to let her know that I'm not the person to mess with. And my mom even joked. She said, DR, you're a throw. You get bench pressed, these girls. <laughs> and so, I, you know, I went around and, you know, I was telling people, yeah, I'm, I'm getting ready. I'm getting pumped up. I'm going to stand up for myself. And so she heard that I was looking for her. And one of my friends, t that's a friend of hers, came up to me and said, she's terrified of you right now. And I said, what do you mean she's scared? You, do you know what she did to me? Like, no, she's so scared of you. And I said, what? And I realized how silly I was being. I was letting a freshman, while I'm a senior, bully me. And I'm much bigger than her. And I, I just realized how silly I was being. I was feeling, what, what am I scared of, you know? You know, and that really gave me courage. You know, it didn't give me you know, power or a good feeling to know that she was scared of me, but it did give me a sense of, I do, I do have a importance. I can be, I can stand up for myself. And so after that point, I think that really helped me to stand up for myself because a lot of people, when a lot of, when a lot of bullying goes on, it goes on in groups of people. And when you confront somebody personally, they're not as powerful alone and they don't know what to do when you confront them face to face. So it's also really important to confront people and tell them how you're feeling. So, um, so I think the most important thing is to acknowledge that you have a problem and there's nothing wrong with going to counseling and just tell somebody. Um, so that was my experience. Thank you. <laughs> so I'd like to uh, thank uh, Congressman Christensen and her staff for uh, inviting me here and everyone on the panel today. And uh, I just want to give you some background pretty fast, and then I'm going to show you what our app does. But the reason why I developed this app over a year and a half ago now was I kept hearing empower the bystander, empower the bystander. And I said, what does that mean? Um, I'm a big technology geek, and uh, I started looking at, I have a son, he's two. And the first app I developed for him, I taught him to learn his ABCs, his numbers, his shapes, and colors. And because I knew where technology was going. And I said, you know, this early age, kids can adopt this stuff so quickly. And that's the reason why I, uh, I developed that. And then I had an idea of hearing researchers say empower the bystander, empower the bystander. And I started looking at the statistics of kids with smartphones and where smartphones was going. And look, today, you got people standing in line for three hours, and that's going to be me later trying to get the iPhone 5. Um, because we're just so addicted to, ne to, to uh, technology. Well, I did a lot of research talking to schools and principals and vice principals. The number one problem was we're finding out too late. We, we, we can't help prevent it because they're putting it on YouTube. So we develop an app that connects directly to school administrators. So now with smartphone technology, all these schools are adopting iPads. So we're putting iPads in every single school for students to have. You can have, we're using technology for good, okay? And so um, I'm going to show you a quick video of the way one school is using it in Texas. Okay, and what we feel is the most important piece to our app is our dashboard. OK, we've been talking to a lot of schools and we want we want the students to send it directly to the school administrator so they can receive it. Well, we're all connected now. We're all connected to our email. So they're going to receive it in real time. OK. And Texas made an eighth um, at Houston ISD. A student called, uh, told her mom that these kids are going to jump on me to the next day. The parent called the school and the school said, it's, it's OK. Everything's going to be fine. Well, 50 kids already knew what was going to happen the next day. You can go watch that video up on YouTube right now. And this, this student got beat up by a lock and a sock. Okay. And we talked to some of the students and we said, Hey, if you, you, if you had this technology, would you have used it? One out of five said yes, because they're saying we already knew what was going to happen. 
we just don't want to be seen going into the office telling telling on students. But with smartphone technology, it's all here. So we feel it's important with our dashboard that the schools receive is this is going to come in immediately and they can go here and click on the message. And now they can manage what's going on in their schools in real time. And so uh, here they can see that it's coming from anonymous student because it's all anonymously. We're, we're giving them exactly where it came from. OK. And then they get that image or that video immediately to where uh, they're saying, well, we have to wait until um, the, the police department or someone sends us that video because it's not real time. Well, now it's real time and they get the image of that video immediately. So if a student comes and say it wasn't me, we know, all know that pictures and videos don't lie. OK, uh, but now they can come in here and they can get that, see that message. Uh, they can provide statuses of those messages so the principals and the vice principals know what's going on. OK, but also they can put them in different categories. It may be bullying. It may be harassment. It may be gangs. It may be suicide. There's all different kind of things going on at the schools. And now they we built a platform to where they can manage it. What we feel also is important, though, is schools right now, because of so many shootings and different things going on in schools, <laughs> schools are looking for solutions to where you can provide notes. So as a principal or safe school person, if there's some additional things that you may want to add notes about a student to look out for or something like that, here in that dashboard, it's all secure. And, it's, and if I put notes, I'm going to say at the conference, now it's saved in that dashboard. So anyone who has access at that school, they see what's going on. Okay. Okay. Now, the other thing that we feel is very, very important is what? Push technology. We're all receiving alerts on our phone and working with a lot of educational psychologists. We feel that with these devices, there's a lot of sad and depressed kids out there. You can if a student sends a message to the school now with our technology, you can send a message back to that student saying we're here to help you. How can we help you? It's still anonymous, but now because of our devices, you're automatically connected to them at all times. So um, we feel it's important, and uh, right now we're putting it into about uh, 50 schools. Um, we've, we've developed it over a year ago, and a year and a half ago, schools were saying, well, we don't want it, we don't have a problem. Because of all the different legislation things coming down, schools are really having to do something. So now they're starting to call us. However, schools have to pay for it. So what we're trying to do right now is work with organizations because schools are saying, wow, can it do this? Can it do that? You know, this is so amazing. Um, and so we're just trying to trying to help them put it in there because they are looking for proactive and preventative type measures that can help them collectively manage what's going on in their schools. Um, so we feel that if you use technology for good, you can help in, uh, decrease what's going on. It's almost like at red lights, you have cameras now. Cops have tasers now. Well, if schools implement our app, it's the psyche of that student. The student knows that the app is in their school. What? They may be using Angry Birds. They may be playing Angry Birds or something, or they may have an app. They don't know if a student is sending them a message to school administrators or they're just sending a message on Facebook. OK, um, here our app, it tackles uh, cyber bullying. But we feel the most important piece is you have resources that you can put into the app. This is all customizable per school. And so research also shows that um, students, they're not going to the website to look for the resources, but every school have an anti-bullying campaign or an anti-bullying initiative. So we allow every single school to customize these resources. You can put videos in here to the students can watch those videos immediately and understand the difference between what is bullying and what's not bullying. So we've taken it to uh, a, a different level and we feel that it's an important tool and, um, and if schools implement it properly, uh, this is our first year putting it into several schools and we're trying to do a pilot so we can analyze the data and figure out how to continue to improve it and move uh, schools and make schools safe. And that's that's 
that's basically at the end of the day. I look at my son who's two and I want him to be in a school that's safe to where it's a free and, and a positive learning environment. So I want to again thank Donna Christensen. Thank everyone here on the panel. Uh, thank you for coming today and God bless you. Please join me in thanking all of the panelists once again. Thank you. Um, if anyone in the audience has questions for any of our panelists, please feel free to raise your hands. I walked in a little late this morning, and I was really wasn't really focused on this issue of bullying the way it was relating. And even though the speakers had some good information for me as a professional, it didn't touch me like your speech. You really need to make sure that you keep on with that because... That power you got coming up out of you, Sister Girl, it, 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 it really just turns people on. And I'd love to see it in there. Just got to encourage. I'm no, I know everybody felt it, so, but I had to say it. Thank you. Uh, when I first came in and sat down, because I'm always observing as a nurse, I looked at you and said, oh, she has beautiful skin. I really like that. I didn't know the story and your self-perceptions, which goes to show we have to be careful about listening to other people. We know the strength and power in us. So I'm, pr I'm proud to hear your story and good to hear you moving forward. I want to thank Donna Christensen for this very important present uh, panel today. And I'd like to make a comment about it in general. That we see it in how the powerful abuse the weak, how the large abuse the small, how males and excuse me, uh, excuse me guys for sometimes abuse women, how powerful governments abuse weaker governments. And my question or suggestion is this one. We need some help to interpret violence and bullying that we see every day in our society, particularly for our children so they know how to perceive it. So is there any group or researchers or someone trying to come up with some constructive information? So what do you say to your children when they're watching uh, cities and communities burn here uh, around the world, and and how do they perceive that? Because they may go away from that and say, okay, if I'm the one to burn something, then I'll be better off. So I think we have to come up with an intervention that helps interpret and redefine the violence so it doesn't become uh, incorporated in the person as bullying. And that's just my question. Thank you for your comment, Dr. Hussain. You're absolutely correct. Um, I, and I'll just say, because we are up against time, that uh, interventions with preschool and, 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 and early childhood are critically important. You mentioned one thing that has been demonstrated to be protective, and that is parents must, parents must not only limit screen time, but when there is screen time, be there to interpret. Critically important. Um, so be there uh, when children are in front of the screen, uh, read to the child, and have at least one meal a day as a family. Now, this just sounds like uh, mom and apple pie, but, but believe it or not, oh, yeah. the longitudinal analysis of, of, of families and children who have that exposure in early childhood uh, uh, are protective and protected once they enter the school environment. So thank you for your comment. I'm actually, I'm going to speak as a psychologist, but as a mom for a second. This is my baby, so I'm very proud of her. Um, one of the things I think, and, and we used to joke with our friends, that my, I have three children. Diara is the youngest. They're 21, uh, 19, and 17. Our children never had a fist fight with each other. Never. And I think one of the reasons for that was we so carefully monitored their TV time. So when they were little, they could have a half an hour a night until they were about in middle school. Um, also, there are certain shows we never allowed them to watch. Wrestling, Family Guy. Yeah, she's, she's telling me all the stuff I didn't let her do. So, And some of that was because we just thought when they were really young, if they were too young to be exposed to that kind of um, um, gratuitous violence. And secondly, when we did let them watch TV, as you suggested, Dr. Wright, we always watched TV with them so that we could kind of talk with them together about that. The other thing, it sounds simplistic, but we had family dinner every night in the week, and we had to talk about our day every day. We also had family meetings, and they, they hate these meetings, but we tease them about them. They had to go around in a circle in the table and tell what they love about each other first before we got into problems. And so it's little things like that. And just, and you know, we can't stress the importance of parental monitoring, that you should know what your kids are exposed to, what they're going through. With Diara, some of her bullying, 
I know she left out some of the parts of the time, but you know, her dad and I would go up to the school and talk to administrators. And finally, we got sick of that because no one, they would say, oh, we got it. And then she'd come home a week later upset. And so I think what really helped her was the therapy and being assertive and just saying to her, you have worth, you have power. But that takes parents who are involved with their kids every day, all day, 24-7. I, I just, I think it's a really important comment and I think it goes to the norms um, point that I was really, um, that I touched on all too briefly, but that the norms that we have is that violence is okay, power over others is um, okay and valued. And I think it's those norms and um, starting in families um, and in our communities that we really have to push back on and push against what we're seeing because it is teaching, I think, um, very damaging um, lessons. So let's thank our panelists for a very, very um, informative